this fall on the race. We're traveling across America and we're going everywhere. Coast to coast and border to border. We're talking to voters about the issues impacting their lives the most. And that the person that's running really cares about the people. From immigration and health care. Well, really equality for everyone. To jobs and gun control. What is the most important issue to you as an American farmer? I have the freedom to do what my great great grandpa did. Every Sunday, a different issue with real conversations about what's working and what's not. We've got too many politicians who are sold out. Giving our viewers better perspective on where each political party stands and doing it with a fresh, balanced approach. Giving them the information they need before the highly contested midterm elections. Join me, Chris Stewart, every Sunday this fall on The Race. The journey to Washington isn't easy. Healthcare, guns, it sparks emotion, but retirement, yikes. In politics, the talk has only been getting hotter, but just days from now, you have a say. This week, we're in Colorado, and we're here in the Bay Area this week. The city that never sleeps, and into your home. Lower taxes, you know, red, blue, whatever. We've been all over. We've come to the port of Los Angeles, the biggest container port in the country. Costing taxpayers millions of dollars. People want answers as the midterms approach. Education certainly is a huge issue in the state. Class is now in session. We got your back. This, this, this is the race. Just look at Heather as an example of what can happen if one person takes a stand. Unfortunately, um, it took a white girl to die before white America and white world bothered to pay attention. We experienced the flooding in 2015, again in 2016, and 2017 in Harvey as well. Everyone around me was going down. Nobody can hurt me here. Over the years, he's been forced to look outside the U.S. But how does the asylum process work in the United States? To be granted asylum in the U.S., you have to be fleeing or afraid of some type of persecution linked to your political opinion, religion, nationality, or ethnicity. Just to be able to have a binational identity in a bicultural world where you have family a lot of times on both sides. We have to invest in infrastructure. Yes. Four million new jobs. They are hiring. All across the country. There's going to be an end to federal prohibition at some point. It doesn't matter what side of the political aisle you're in. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't affect you. I love to hear that whistleblower. Since Ben Franklin went out in a thunderstorm with a key and a kite, electricity has been a huge part of American life. Nowadays, we have a huge system across the continental U.S. So what is the U.S. electric grid? Thanks to a bill passed in 1934, our utilities are regulated by the government. The feds wanted to make the system more connected and add safeguards from both the natural disasters and things like terrorist attacks. Our current grid is made of more than 160,000 miles of transmission lines, millions of miles of distribution lines, more than 7,000 power plants, and more than 55,000 substations. And all of the pieces that connect a power plant to you are broken into three different interconnections, Eastern, Western, and Texas. Yeah, yeah, the state of Texas. There's a bunch of power transfers that happens within each of the interconnections. If one city needs a little bit of help because of a storm, they can get some help from another one within the interconnection. But for now, they are pretty self-contained, and it's not easy to send energy from the eastern to the western interconnection. That could change soon. There's a plan to permanently tie and synchronize the three systems called the Trace Amigas Superstation. 
That connection should make the entire American grid more reliable and would make it easier to move to renewable energy. This midterm, Democrats are trying to regain control of Congress and Republicans are on defense. Whoever wins those races will likely have a big advantage to keeping their seat and their party in control for the next decade. On the state level, the party in power gets to draw legislative districts every 10 years. Oftentimes, they group people of the opposing party into the same few districts. And for themselves, they spread their voters out into multiple, much smaller districts. That's called gerrymandering. Because every district gets a representative, the party in power winds up with their people in control. So why would we want gerrymandered districts? Well, because, let's face it, life is messy and people don't live in perfect squares. And sometimes those odd shapes do help represent communities who may otherwise have been underrepresented. Right now, it's completely legal to gerrymander for partisan reasons. But the fight is growing both in the courts and in Congress to get rid of it. People from all over the world immigrate to the United States for different reasons every day. For example, they can be coming for college or a new job, or they can be seeking asylum and protection. But how does the asylum process work in the United States? To be granted asylum in the U.S., you have to be fleeing or afraid of some type of persecution linked to your political opinion, religion, nationality, or ethnicity. You can also be a member of a particular social group facing persecution. You also have to be able to prove all of this with evidence, which can be tough for a lot of asylum seekers. There are two types of asylum in America, defensive and affirmative. Defensive is used after deportation proceedings have already begun. A judge will hear the evidence and then make a decision. Affirmative asylum can be done without being in federal custody. You would fill out an application, be fingerprinted, go through some background and security checks, and eventually get an interview. The length of the process can be different based on each case, but it's typically made within about six months. It's one of the most divisive issues in this country. Guns. It sparks emotion and passionate debate from schools and security to its history and hunting. Should there be more restrictions or freedom? What role should firearms play in our lives? All very important questions. So we've come here to Las Vegas tomorrow, marking one year since the mass shooting. How has the worst mass shooting in US history changed this community? A sensitive topic, and we're not here to take sides. Just give you the information you need to make an informed decision on election day. This is The Race. Welcome into The Race, I'm Chris Stewart, and we're here in Las Vegas, where tomorrow they'll be marking one year since the shooting that left 58 people dead and more than 800 people hurt. Behind me right here is a healing garden that's being put together to remember all the lives that were lost. And it's mass shootings like the one that happened here that really thrust the conversation about guns in this country into the spotlight. So during this show, we are going to be taking on what is a very complex issue. We're going across the country and taking a look at how firearms are impacting people's lives. But first, we do want to get started here in Las Vegas, talking to a woman who was at that country music festival last year. Her life changed forever by what happened and her journey to find peace. Most people come to Red Rock Canyon to admire it. And Raina Davis is no different. It teaches me. Her visits here are about more than experiencing its beauty. She's finding her peace. Nobody can hurt me here. Last year, Raina and her fiance Opie were celebrating his birthday at the Route 91 Harvest Music Festival in Las Vegas when she heard shots, then saw the unimaginable. Everyone around me was going down, and I wasn't. She miraculously escaped unharmed. I had bullet holes through the bill of my cap, through my purse. Um, I had bullet holes. I'm telling you, there's no human explanation as to how I'm here. Somebody was watching over me. But with feelings of gratitude came feelings of guilt that her fiance had to recover from a gunshot wound. He got shot saving my life. And 58 others lost their lives. 
It's the hardest, most grueling year of my life. But she was determined to move forward. I was a city girl. This is my new normal. Raina moved from Vegas to a small town and spends several days a week here. I feel like it's big enough for me to dump the stuff that hurts me here. She talks with her therapist, fiance, and other survivors about her experiences and gets out and helps others. Now, a year later, she's okay knowing some questions may never be answered. I don't know why they didn't make it, and I don't know why we did, but I'm not going to waste any more time trying to figure it out. It is what it is. We will never know why or his reasoning. We'll never know. Okay, you got to make peace with that. Using the beauty of nature. I feel like I'm in God's country here. To bring hope. And then you always find something to smile about. While healing. For The Race, I'm Kumasi Aaron. All right, we've come along the strip here in Las Vegas, not far from where that shooting happened last year. And let's talk about gun laws here for a second. A big deal when it comes to who you vote for, not just in a local election, but you look all the way up to a federal election as well. And these are new numbers that we have from PolitiFact coming in March, asking people how they feel about gun laws in America. 67% saying they think gun laws need to be stronger in this country, only 4% saying that they need to be less strict, 28% of people saying they're good where where things are right now. Well, Corey Rangel, he went to go talk to both Republicans and Democrats about not just where they stand on gun laws, but also issues of gun violence in America. Democrats and Republicans in Congress have still not found a meaningful way to stop gun violence, despite a list of ideas from both sides. Republicans can lead on a couple ways. They, they, they can talk about more investment in mental health funding. I think there's also a way to lead on it through getting more funds for school security. And I think the third thing is, you know, spending more money on social media because so many of these people are tipping themselves off. The point that Democrats are making is we know that there are a number of different ideas, whether it's background checks, waiting periods, being able to make sure that databases are talking to each other. Even with the range of proposals, little has actually been done at the federal level. The biggest piece of gun-related legislation Congress passed this year is the Fix Nix bill, which improves reporting to the background check system. Both political parties try to seize political advantage, and they both do. Um, and there's not any, there doesn't seem to be any solutions that are, that are coming forward. And I think that that is one of the most frustrating things about this debate because kids are getting killed and something needs to happen. Frustrated with Congress, many states are taking the lead in gun legislation. 55 gun safety bills have been signed into law in 26 states since the deadly Parkland school shooting in February, including 14 states with Republican governors. I think what you're seeing uh, is more movement at the state level, where to some degree maybe there's a little bit more of a, a direct accountability loop <laughs> in some ways, and your ability to you know put real pressure on your mayor, on your governor, on your you know state legislature. For the race, I'm Corey Rangel, and when the race continues continues here from Las Vegas, you are going to hear from a good guy with a gun, how he and his firearm stopped an active shooter before any lives were lost. Welcome back to the race here in Las Vegas. I'm Chris Stewart and in the mass shooting that happened here last year, the gunman ended up taking his own life. Much different situation in Oklahoma earlier this year where two men who were armed were in the right place at the right time and stopped a shooter when he opened fire inside a restaurant. Nicole Val talked to one of those men who say they were able to stop this shooter before this situation got worse. I'm going to turn left to get on the highway. I noticed a bunch of people running from the restaurant. I told my wife, I was like, something's wrong that doesn't look right. What was supposed to be a Memorial Weekend getaway for Brian Whittle took him on a detour here to Louis Bar and Grill in Oklahoma City, a detour that turned deadly. When I pulled in the parking lot right here, I stopped right here um, and I got out. And there was an individual here who was telling me that the people were shot. Police say a mentally ill man wearing ear and eye protection opened fire in the crowded eatery. Whittle, with his 19 years military experience and seven deployments under his belt, grabbed his loaded pistol from his truck. When I got here and started yelling at him, he, he turned to face me. And so he, when he faced me is when I was trying to get him to put it down and then waved my arm at him, and that's when he raised up to fire at me. 
two shots swirled in his direction. He knew he had to stop the threat. When I got about right here, I saw him standing there. And as soon as I saw him, I just kept firing. Just pop, 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 pop. A second armed civilian ran to help Whittle. The gunman was dead. In this situation, I didn't really, I didn't have really time to think. I just reacted. Under the self-defense statute, he was cleared of all criminal charges. The story earning him the title of good guy with a gun. A story he wants others to hear. I don't think that there should be any uh, roadblocks that impede your Second Amendment. He says no one should tamper with the rights of an American citizen or take away anyone's ability to defend and protect. You'll end up in a situation similar to this and not be able to do anything but hide and cower behind a car. It's just like any other tool. If you have the right tool, you can fix anything. So I just happen to have the right tool for the right problem. For The Race, I'm Nicole Vowell reporting. Now the gun lobby, that can be a powerful force in politics. These numbers from PolitiFact illustrate direct contributions to candidates. You can see pro-gun contributions far outpaced pro-gun control in the last midterm. Then the pro-gun spending went way up for the presidential race. Now though, both sides are much closer in their contributions and the pro-gun donations dropped significantly. Now the one pro-gun group that we do hear a lot about is the NRA. And there's a new poll that came out that talked to both gun owners and non-gun owners that found something really interesting when it comes to the NRA. Here's Newsy's Eugene Daniels. You'd be hard pressed to find a topic more polarizing than the NRA and guns in America. You're either funding the killers or you are standing with the children. As trying to blame five million innocent um, um, law-abiding gun owners all across the country There's for been this. no blaming here. No, all there I'm has asking been, is though. For there, all I know, but there has position. been. But how do everyday Americans who don't end up on cable news feel about the largest gun rights group in the country? Well, Newsy and the polling firm Ipsos went out and asked more than 2,000 gun owners and non-gun owners about their thoughts, and some of the answers might surprise you. For instance, you might think that most NRA supporters would be gun owners themselves, but our poll found that's not really the case. 59% of respondents who support the group don't actually own any guns. A talking point on cable news and Twitter is that people who are anti-NRA want to go around snatching guns out of everyone's hands. But our poll found the opposite. 60% of respondents who aren't fans of the NRA still think civilians should, quote, be allowed to purchase, operate, and carry handguns. And it's not just non-gun owners or anti-NRA folks that surprised us. 38% of gun owners surveyed think the NRA is stopping politicians from writing meaningful gun control laws. And 42% of that same group think we would have a safer country if there were stricter gun control laws. Gun control and gun rights advocates don't agree on much, at least not in large numbers. But our poll found there might be less disparity between the groups on certain aspects of the debate. Well, you don't have to have kids to get upset when you hear about school shootings. And when the race continues from Las Vegas, we're going to be taking a look at one school using some of the newest technology to keep its students safe. They say it's a small price to pay to potentially save a life. Welcome back to The Race, I'm Chris Stewart. We're here in Las Vegas where tomorrow they're gonna to be marking one year since the attack that left 58 people dead. The type of attack we've seen play out in places like movie theaters and in churches. And it also takes place, of course, in schools. Right now, school security, that's a $2.6 billion industry. Nicole Vowell went to a school in Chicago though that's saying that price is a small one to pay for a peace of mind. Keeping students safe. It's a top priority at St. Benedict's Catholic School on Chicago's north side. Over the last several years, about seven years, um, there's been a lot of effort to make sure that the doors are locked, that we've installed different um, components of security systems around the school. Head of the school, Rachel Gemmo, says drills we once knew, like fire and weather drills, have changed dramatically. But lately it has been really focusing on this, the physical safety of the students, particularly from active shooters or active weapon situations. This year, the almost 750 students here were trained on how to use a new safety device. Basically, it functions just like a fire alarm would, 
where you would pull down and it would activate an alarm system that pages instead of the fire department, this one would page the police department. Pushing in and pulling down will activate the system. It silently alerts police there's a threat. It also visually alerts students. Those strobes uh, alert all the students that are in the hallways and are alone to seek either shelter or an adult. Louis Karajanis, the school's tech guru, explains how the Blue Point system also sends real-time text alerts to teachers. It's like this. Once it's activated, it activates immediately. The text message links to a map pinpointing the location of the threat on campus. It also allows for communication real time and offers video feeds to be viewed from dozens of cameras. And they operate wirelessly and are independent of our internet. So if our internet goes down, it does not affect them. And those blue boxes go one step further inside the classroom. All faculty and staff here are equipped with these mobile devices that activate the exact same system which they have to push both buttons simultaneously. This $100,000 investment is one Gemmo says she hopes she never has to use, but says it's worth every penny. We wanted to just make sure that we were doing everything we could to keep our, our students and our faculty safe because one loss is, is too great. For The Race, I'm Nicole Vowell reporting. Now the Second Amendment, that addresses our rights to guns as citizens, but Let's face it, 226 years later, it is contentious and it is difficult to explain. And cartoonist Nick Referzo and Newsy's Alex Miller team up to show us why. It may be only 27 words and one sentence, but it's arguably the most controversial piece of information our founders left us. We're talking about the Second Amendment. It's been poked and prodded by some of our nation's most brilliant minds. Some say we should interpret it plainly, others say we need to analyze the sentence down to the grammar to figure out what the founders were trying to say. Two phrases in particular stick out. The first phrase, a well-regulated militia, is where much of the disagreement with the amendment lies. Some say the word militia refers to the state's responsibility to have their people armed. Others say it means civilians should make up a militia if the government turns on its own people. Those who fall on the side of tighter gun control often also argue a militia is unnecessary in present day. Overall, they believe the Second Amendment should be interpreted to reflect present day. They believe the word arms in the phrase the right of the people to keep and bear arms has evolved. Automatic and semi-automatic weapons did not exist during the writing of the Bill of Rights, and they say the interpretation of the amendment should reflect the changing times. Second Amendment advocates say the phrase shows it is a specific right and not a privilege for people to not only keep guns, but carry them, in public or private, open or concealed. Because the founders gave no more direction or discussion about the amendment and the deeper meaning behind it, people will continue to see what they are looking for in it. Some of the strongest Second Amendment advocates are in the hunting community. Nicole Val talked to one of the more than 15 and a half million licensed hunters in America about what the right to bear arms means to him. Mark Martineau, he's just your average American from Utah who loves guns. He's got a lot of hardware for the sport of shooting. But what he enjoys most is going out with his friend John Hansen to hunt. These are just a few of the, the hunts we've been on. From big game hunting in Africa to deer or bears, you name it. You go out there, go hunt for your food, you know, feel like a man. Yeah, it's it's a good time. And when it comes to the controversy surrounding the Second Amendment. If there's a law, you keep the law. If there's a rule, you keep the rule. There's no bending or breaking them. He doesn't deny that violence involving guns in America is a problem, but says one solution is to arm more responsible people. Who is the one that's saving the crowds when it does happen? Concealed weapon permits holders. And when it comes to gun control, Martineau agrees with one aspect, but still has his reservations. A mentally ill person should not own a firearm, but I guess it just all comes down to who is the person that is deeming them mentally ill. It all comes down to firearms education, he says. Learning and loving and respecting the firearm. You gotta, you gotta teach your kids young to respect them. And trusting that the majority of gun owners in America, like him, are good. We're law-abiding citizens and 
that's where we plan to stay. For the race, I'm Nicole Vowell reporting. Still to come here on the race from Las Vegas, a place that will be marking one year since the attack that left 58 people dead. We're going to show you the ways this community has already started to come together. Maybe it's their smiles or the looks in their eyes, but it's easy to see. This is more than a collection of portraits, but of moments. He was actually on a date. Joe Robbins' son Quentin's picture is front and center. He was going on a date with somebody that he didn't know because she didn't have a date for the dance. But if given a choice, he'd prefer not to see his son's picture or any of the others on display. It's heart-wrenching to know that he is actually gone. And we can't just call him or text him, ask him how he's doing that day. Quentin was one of 58 people who lost their lives on October 1st, 2017, when a gunman fired into the crowd at a concert in Las Vegas. Every day is a struggle for myself, my wife, my kids, and those around us that loved him. Now, seeing his son smile here is bringing him a bit of peace. That's what we remember about him. Always smiling, always willing to have a good time, and always willing to share with others in those good times. It's part of the Portrait Project in Las Vegas, an exhibit of portraits of the 58 victims painted by artists from around the world for free. An artist in South Africa created Quentin's portrait. His family later found out they were distantly related. It's amazing what people are willing to do for you and you know out of their own comfort and their own help to just find peace. The two cousins who put this all together said their goal was to bring families comfort and Joe says they've done that and much more. You know that was one of the goals of the Las Vegas Portraits Project is to just prove that evil doesn't win. A bittersweet reminder. As a pitcher, he would have thought that he could have taken a better picture. Of incredible loss. Hopefully there's not another event that's needed for a portrait project like this. And love. For The Race, I'm Kamasi Aaron. That'll do it for us this week here on The Race from Las Vegas, where tomorrow they're marking one year since the attack that left 58 people dead. We do want you to join us next week here on The Race as we tackle another very complex, very sensitive issue here in America, and that is immigration. From the border wall to DACA to family separation, we're going to be digging into all of those things, so join us next week here on The Race.